but it does it does require a certain what what Kevin Van Hooser calls uh, sapiential apologetics, and he's saying apologetic of wisdom. And so we're concerned not only about the arguments, but by how we're forming certain types of apologists so they have wisdom and they have virtue. And so when they're in a conversation, they're able to to really pull in like it's it's what a pastor does. It's what or being pastoral or a counselor does. Um, rather than just saying, I've memorized this answer and let me regurgitate it to you. And um, so it's as much about being the right type of a of apologist, the right type of person, as it is about having the right type of answers, which both are important. So both are you got to know some stuff, right? But 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 if it but if you aren't wise in how you apply your knowledge, um, often we've seen people be ineffective um, as they're as they're trying to open up doors for the gospel. <laughs> watching another episode of the Jew 3 Project podcast. As always, I'm your host, Lisa Fields, the founder of the Jew 3 Project. And today I'm joined by a very special guest, Dr. Josh, Josh Shotraw. I, I'm, I know I'm pronouncing it wrong. <laughs> oh, that's good. It's Shotro. That's okay. You can just call me Josh. It's okay. <laughs> that's always the, the easiest one. Um, welcome, Josh. How are you doing today? I'm good. I'm good. Good to I'm be excited. on the podcast. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on. For those who don't know who you are, just give them a little bit of background. Yeah, I'm the uh, I'm the director for apologetics and cultural engagement at Liberty University, and I teach courses on apologetics and cultural engagement, theology, uh, and uh, I was a I was a pastor before I came to Liberty, uh, and uh, working on my PhD, and that's kind of how I got into apologetics, actually, through pastoral ministry. Awesome. Well, I'm excited to have you on. We were, me and Vince were just uh, up there. Was it February with uh, you? Um, yes, doing a, yeah, February. Yeah, doing a seminar. Um, time goes by fast because it's already May. So <laughs> that seemed like that was just yesterday when we were there. So <laughs> thank you for, for having us. We enjoyed our time there. Uh, we're going to talk about your new book um, along with Mark Allen, Apologetics at the Cross. Yeah, um, I'm excited about this book because I think this is, um, is this Zondervan's first, um, their first apologetic sex book, correct? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's probably other books that have, that Zondervan has, have published that are, that have been used as textbooks, but I don't know of one recently that's more of a textbook. So I don't know historically what they've done, but I, I think this is the first one that's primary primary goal is to be used as a textbook Mm -hmm. through Zondervan anyway. And I know um, you, uh, I I remember you talking to me when you were in the process of writing this book, uh, when we were at the apologetics leaders meeting. Um, So I'm excited that it's finally coming out. What made you want to write this book? Yeah, well, when I, when I was started teaching apologetics, um, and really start looking at apologetics books. What I found was there's lots of helpful books that were uh, written by academic philosophers that I found to be really useful, um, and and yet there 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 seemed to be a little bit of a disconnect between my students who were training for the ministry and kind of on the street in the pew apologetics and and those books. And then on the other hand, I I found some really helpful kind of evangelistic books that were really practical, uh, you know, really focused on tactics and conversations. And yet it, it, some of those, although I, again, for me and for many people, very useful, but they lack some of the philosophical and theological sophistication that I think we really, we really need. And so there was kind of this in between kind of area, which I didn't think there was. And, and so, so it was like, I really wasn't happy <laughs> with any other book. And and so as Mark and I started talking about it, we were sort of envisioning kind of kind of a, something that's rigorous, that's a scholarly, but that brings it down and packages it for for the pastor, for 
the, the person training for ministry who's going to do this, um, not in an academic setting, but is going to need those academic uh, resources, the best of what we have out there translated for them. And so then we set out about three years, three years ago to write that. And it was, I think, harder than we thought it was going to be. Uh, but, but we're pretty proud of kind of how it's turned out and hopeful that, uh, that it's going to be useful. Mm-hmm. And I know that's kind of your approach to, to po- apologetics and in general, making it more accessible for people. When you think about doing apologetics, what is kind of your, your strategy? Yeah, well, one of the things we've outlined in the book is what we call inside out. And inside out is an approach where it's really, I think, borrowing from some kind of top level philosophers who most people uh, trained for ministry at undergrad or even grad level aren't going to be able to probably uh, work their way through people like Charles Taylor, Alistair McIntyre, um, and, 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 and a few others. But, but what we've tried to do is recognize that people are, we're never engaging a blank slate. Okay. We're always engaging someone with a background, with a history, with a way of thinking. And so rather than starting kind of, Hey, this is where I'm at and I want you to kind of get on board of what, where I'm at. This is my favorite argument or this is my favorite way to reason. Inside Out says, says yeah, you need to have like a, a robust understanding of the gospel, a robust theology. But then actually theologically, if we start reflecting on the gospel, what that drives us to is a certain other centeredness where we say, okay, let me step inside their framework. This person has a framework for thinking, of imagining, of believing certain things. Now, how can I how can I begin to understand where they're coming from, their framework, step into it, and then say, hey, inside of this framework, as I'm understanding it, what can I affirm? What's here that's actually overlaps with my framework, the gospel framework? And what can I say? Yeah, me too. But then what can I say? But no. <laughs> And so it's what can I affirm and what can I challenge about this framework? And then what were some of the tensions within the framework? What, what are some of the things they're saying? But then at the same time, even though they're, they're affirming something like uh, universal benevolence or they're affirming something like justice, where we can say, yes, yes, but does your worldview really have the goods to deliver on that? Do you really have the resources for that? And so some of these kind of tensions and say, hey, and then, so we start inside of their framework, and then we say, "Hey, this is how this is how the gospel makes actually better sense of of what you're saying." And so it's it's a it's a really a, it's the approach that we outline in the book is a is one that we think people can use uh, just in normal conversations. You, you kind of say, "Okay, I don't know anything about this person. Let's begin to talk." But as you're doing it mentally, you're thinking through, hang on, what what here do I need to come back to and, and challenge? And what are some things here that I can actually affirm? Rather than apologetics being, as Charles Taylor has called it in one of his books, you know, he, he calls these things is plagued by what he calls conversation stoppers. Three reasons why you're stupid and totally naive. Now let's have a conversation which rarely works mm-hmm. <laughs> for people who actually do this, right? That doesn't really work. And so part of, part of apologetics is being a good listener, I think. And so we need, to, we need to restore this kind of hermeneutic of love where we're listening to the person in order to help them um, with, with where they're at, come closer to the gospel and to Christ. Mm-hmm. And I think traditionally, that's probably why it's been so hard for people to do uh, apologetics effectively is because they're not good listeners. Um, because when the more you read, the more you want to share what you know with people, and it makes it hard to to actually listen because you're listening for a place to to talk, and not for it to actually listen and understand the person's perspective. Um, do you agree with that, Josh? Yeah, I mean, especially when you think you know all the. Uh questions before they're asked and you know the answers and so you're just waiting for you know you're you're waiting for the question and if they don't have the question you'll assume that they must um that you're ready to answer so you'll assume that and i think um and i so i think we need to slow down a little bit we need to slow down a little bit and say what is this person really asking and then also recognizing there's a certain um 
the, the, the same question, you know, this person who's asking this question, maybe you've heard it a hundred times, but it's a different person asking that question and they might have different things going on. And that, I mean, that's not always, um, you're not always able to get in there and kind of try to figure out what's going on, but that should be the goal. And, and so I think the way we're suggesting it, it gives some scaffolding, it gives some kind of, it's not just do whatever you want, but it does, it does require a certain, what, what Kevin Van Hooser calls uh, sapiential apologetics. And he's saying apologetic of wisdom. And so we're concerned not only about the arguments, but by how we're forming certain types of apologists. So they have wisdom and they have virtue. And so when they're in a conversation, they're able to, to really pull in, like it's, it's what a pastor does. It's what, or being pastoral or a counselor does. Um, rather than just saying, I've memorized this answer and let me regurgitate it to you. And um, so it's as much about being the right type of, of apologist, the right type of person, as it is about having the right type of answers, which both are important. So both are, you got to know some stuff, right? But, 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 if it, but if you aren't wise in how you apply your knowledge, um, often we've seen people be ineffective um, as, they're, as they're trying to open up doors for the gospel. Yeah. It's like two wings on a plane. You can't have one with, you don't want one without the other because you're not going anywhere, <laughs> anywhere without both of them. And stereotypically, uh, and, you know, stereotypes can be bad, but stereotypically with, with my students, with my undergrads especially, um, it's the type of student that is drawn to apologetics is real, tends to be really, um, strong with okay memorizing arguments give me the the logical syllogisms syllogisms but not very good at the actual kind of um uh, the wisdom of the cross that i think we should have as apologists and that actually takes a lot more time um you can't just you know watch a youtube video or a podcast and get that so what you need is actually what god's given us which is the local church, you need mentors, you need um, to be in the kind of rhythms and patterns of the church that creates these types of, the Lord uses to create these types of virtues. And so really it's a, it's a, it's a reconnecting apologetics with a strong ecclesiology, a strong vision for discipleship. Mm -hmm. That's, that's awesome. Um, when we think about what a, how apologetics has to shift for this generation, especially engaging millennials and Gen Z. Uh, what have you seen as some some necessary things that we should be thinking through? Um, because I know that we, when um, I was with uh, Barner when they launched um, their new stats and they talked about how Gen Z is more emotional than logical. So the logical arguments um, are kind of hard to use to engage them because they're emotion first. Yeah. Um, do you see that same thing? Um, yeah, I, some of the language I'd want to adjust a little bit. <laughs> um, but I, I, I know what you're getting at, and I do, and I, I, so I can generally affirm what you're saying is, that, is, that, is that's what I'm seeing. But I want to adjust some of the language because Really, we think, and, 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 and to some of my apologetic friends, it would be kind of like, that just is so frustrating. Because it's like, I can't help it, they're emotional. I'm going to give them the logic, the facts. And I, I think it's more complicated than that. And in fact, what we know from um, various disciplines is actually you need the kind of emotions to be good at logic. You need imagination to be good at logic. And so it's not like you just have logic and emotions but you're not actually going to be, uh, um, you might just say you might, you're not gonna actually be very bright if you actually don't have well-trained emotions and, and well-trained and, and, and intuitions and imagination to be able to put these facts together. And so I, I just, I, so sometimes when we say in apologetic circles, like you know, appeal to emotion, people just say, well, what do you mean appeal to emotion? We need to appeal to truth. And I'm saying, no, you can't actually, you're going to be able to receive truth better if, if your affections are properly aimed. 
So I like the I like the uh, I like to use the language of affections, which which and, and I, at least in our culture can signify at least slow people down there a little bit to say okay there's when we're talking about emotions we might not be talking about the same thing as like when Jonathan Edwards or Augustine when we think about what they're talking about with some of this okay so sorry that was that was my um, <laughs> my professorial footnotes there but I I do think just of what that saying is right in that. I'd put it like this. They don't, they want to know that Christianity is good and beautiful. And that's, that's just as important to them as, as it being true. And so Christianity is good, true and beautiful, but oftentimes we need to front load with a case for it being good and it being beautiful because they won't even listen to the true part until we make that case, which is an argument, but it's more than an argument. Um, it, it's a, you can argue in different ways. You might argue in a story as Jesus often did. And so there is a an argument to be made. There is persuasion that needs to happen, but there's various ways that that persuasion can not happen at that point. So they can, cause you really do have to open up their imagination. You really have to, uh, do, of course the, the Lord does that, but that's what we're seeking at is that, is that the Lord would use us to open up their imagination, to open up their heart. And um, so I, I think one of the things that we're seeing is apologists are coming around. I'm, I'm, I'm encouraged. I'm optimistic. They're coming around. Not that we're going to throw out Christianity is true. It needs to be true. And it is true. But to front load with these other object to front load with these with these other types of arguments. And there's still arguments, even though they'll, they'll come at us in different forms. Mm hmm. And I think it's it's interesting when the assessment is made that Gen Z and millennials uh, are lead more with emotion or um, affection as you, that's the word you use, right? Affection, yeah. yeah. Um, as if baby boomers and Gen Y didn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, I think they I did think, too. I mean, I, yeah. They were, I think the, the difference is Gen X and I'm and millennial, which is a Gen X still, and Gen Z are more vocal about about it versus um, the previous generations. Yeah, I mean, I think. Yeah, I mean, there's a certainly, certainly. I mean, you can see this with with men, for instance, where there's a certain uh, uh, reluctance to kind of show show emotion. Or um, and I think that that is not, you know, you know, my my father's generation I think would might be like that in general. I'm making really painting with broad brush brush strokes to start off the show, but I, I think in general I would agree with that. And then um, and in general I think men now are, younger men are, are more open to those types of things to sh showing emotions and admitting. They have emotions. <laughs> they have an emotional <laughs> life. That's a good. That's a good stuff. <laughs> that's that's definitely true. Um, what? Why did you and um, Dr. Allen title this "Apologetics at the Cross"? Yeah. Well, so we contrast that. Um, we actually con contrast this with an apologist of glory. So we're actually for for the. For the church history folks listening in or watching in, is that uh, Martin Luther had this language of a theologian of the cross versus a theologian of the of glory, and so we appropriated Luther a little bit at that point, saying there's certain characteristics of a of an apologist of the cross, and that it's not about their own kind of personal needs to show off, but it's about helping the other person. It's about having a certain humility before God and before others. Um, and there's an epi epistemological humility there that even that there's certain things as an apologist that we're not quite sure about. Um, and um, recognizing that, um, you know, part of uh, the role of, a, of an apologist is to live under the cross, which means to suffer well. And the, the cross reminds us of this. And so we actually think one of the conversation, hopefully starters of the book is to say, look, the debates we've had about theological method in the past are, have been necessary and are helpful. And we're not saying that they were totally 
a dead end or a wrong turn. But we're saying what would what what might happen is if we reimagine apologetics around the gospel itself, around the cross and and the resurrection. The the res the what would happen? What would it look like? And and what we're saying is it's not as though those debates between various schools of apologist apologetics is off the table now. But this could give us uh, what we think is a more important thing to talk about, which is how the gospel should actually impact the forms, the methodology, the apologist himself or herself. Um, so we kind of want to shift the conversation a little bit. And what we also think is that it, what, what we hope to happen is that this could be something that even people who disagree some on methodology on, the, on some different schools could rally around. And, and kind of rethinking apologetics around the gospel and around the cross. Mm -hmm. And maybe this could open up ways for uh, pastors uh, who kind of push shun apologetics to uh, be more be more open to it, um, because there is often in I've seen that some pastors are resistant to it because they've seen it done poorly, or they think of, when they think apologetics, they think about debates. Mm -hmm. Um, so help, hopefully this can help reframe for some people as well. Yeah. And I think I, I actually, I don't, I don't know if you saw it, Lisa, I just wrote an article for, uh, that came out with Christianity Today and I was talking about this, um, from, from different, different angles. Cause in, in some academic circles, apologetics is looked down upon because, you know, if you're, a, if you're an apologist then you're biased, you're not coming in, you know, you're coming in already with your conclusion. Or, you know, we just, we don't try to convert people and academics, um, which, which everyone tries to convert people, but that, that's beside the point. <laughs> um, and, and, or on the other side, all we need is the gospel. It's a simple message. It's a simple truth that we proclaim. And so it's actually kind of a, sometimes it can be a little challenging because you got academics, some academics who don't want anything to do with it. Um, and then you have some pastors who don't want anything to do with it. and but before we blame both of those groups, maybe we should look at ourselves and say, hang on, <laughs> maybe we should start here rather than just blaming them. And so there is a certain growing up, I think, that needs to happen uh, just in general and um, a recognition of apologetics going bad. And um, there's a place for debate. There's a place for that kind of um, context, you know, and, and not it's but it's not where most people are at. And so if, if a debate format becomes the model, kind of the model that everyone looks to of, this is how we do it, I think we've got problems. Because I, I think what, for most people, when they're convinced of something, it's gonna actually come through conversations and dialogue. And there's gonna be some give and take. Um, and there's gonna be an understanding of one another. So I, I actually think it's, Number well, I would say number two. This isn't primary, but number two, it's a more effective strategy. It's just a more effective strategy. <laughs> so if you actually kind of want to win, quote unquote, and we we want to win people to Christ, I think it's just more effective. But I would actually put a theological basis on it, in, in that we're called to be a certain type of people that have gentleness and respect. First Peter three fifteen, who are wise towards outsiders who love even our enemies. And, and, and one of the challenges, one of the, cha one of the things that's changed from, if you look at the first century and you look at today, you look at the early church, there's some parallels there, right? Pluralistic context. Um, Christianity was looked at as weird when it kind of came on the scene and morally weird. What are, what are these people doing? And so if you look, the objection was these people are, are, we, ha you know, they're, they're not going along with the rest of society. They have a different moral code and um, they could be problematic. They could cause unrest for the state. And, and so, so there's these kind of issues and we look at our situation today and we see, hey, there's some similar issues there. But one of the differences is that they were the new kids on the block there. Now we've got 2000 years of history and it's not all good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, no. Um, and, and so, so with that now, they're saying, Hey, not only are you weird and we think your ethics are wrong, but we've got ev evidence to prove it. 
you know, we look at, so they're all of a sudden they become the evidentialists, you know, <laughs> and they're pointing out all the bad things that Christianity has done for the world. Well, that's a, that is a, a challenge and there's different ways we need to respond to that. But one of the ways is that we have to be different types of people. We can't be the caricature that they're trying to, to make us out to be. And I think, and so I think one of the quickest ways to reinforce this kind of notion that we're just out to kind of grab power and to be coercive is that in our one-on-one -on -one dialogues, we're kind and gentle and faithful and um, and loving and and so and and that seems to be what the gospel is saying that seems to be what the sermon on the mount is saying standing for truth standing for truth with courage but that doesn't mean with a fist in the air and you know veins popping out and uh so i think it's really important given our context that that we stress this type of um charity and grace and um, this virtue of humility for the apologist. And so I think it's theologically rooted, but it's also very timely that we, that, that we emphasize this as the church. Mm -hmm. And, and that's why I love uh, your method so much because it's so similar to, to what I'm trying to do at the G3 project, making sure people are equipped, but then exposing them to other ideas but in a way that shows, hey, we can interact with people who we disagree with and be loving and not have a, a quote unquote debate, but a conversation. Um, yeah. And so uh, I think that's what you're doing um, with your book and just your work in apologetics ministry in general. So I, I greatly appreciate that. Um, what what, uh, what else about the book do you want to share with our audience that we may have not already covered? Yeah. Um, well, one of the things we saw, so when we got into this is we saw, oh my goodness, there, there's actually in most, in most books on apologetics, there's actually, um, uh, not a whole lot on the Bible. <laughs> Again, pretty sweeping statement, but it was most, most books have it in there. It's just not an emphasis. I mean, in other words, first Peter three fifteen, Colossians four, five through six, there's certain proof texts that are used. And then let's go into this kind of system. But with our background being in um, Mark's background at Notre Dame, being in uh, ancient Near Eastern, you know, literature and and basically the Bible, and my background being in biblical theology, it is one of the things we we looked at is oh my goodness, the the whole Bible is incredibly apologetic. It's it's very contextual. And so it's speaking into a certain culture, it's challenging the culture, and then it's pointing forward to, to a better way, ultimately to Christ. And so whether you go to Genesis, uh, you know, and, and that kind of cultural milieu in the ancient Near Eastern world, or you go to John 1 and the Logos and the kind of significance of that, how, how John can say, hey, yes, there actually is this kind of uh, uh, transcendent, force holding the universe together, but it's not just a force, it's a person. And so you couldn't help but hear Logos and kind of people's ears perk up in the ancient world because of the philosophical kind of connection with that word. And 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 and, and yet at the same time, he's going much further than that and even, and even challenging that notion using at the same time Old Testament, you know, kind of imagery he pulls in to say, hey, it's even better than you imagined that. It's, you're getting maybe a little hint of it, but it's more than that. The Logos is a person, and we know that person through Jesus Christ. So, so what I'm saying, this is two examples, Genesis 1 and 3 and John 1, but you see in things maybe we don't think about how, how they're actually affirming, challenging, and pointing to another way throughout the Bible. So the way the Bible is functioning is actually apologetic. And so we really try to try to draw some of these things out in the first two chapters of the book which we feel like this really hasn't been tied into a whole lot of apologetic books. And then the other thing, which is understandable because one of the things you, when you're an author that you learn is you can't do everything you want to do, but for us, and so it's understandable why people left out much of church history. But for us, this was really important. If we're going to train people in apologetics, they have, they know something about kind of the history of apologetics. 
So two of our chapters after the Bible chapters are actually tracing out from the early church to um, the modern period to the current period on apologetics. And, 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 and doing that really quick, but allowing people to see some of the overflow. So historically, apologetics isn't just Aquinas or isn't just, you know, Paley or isn't just uh, Augustine or, or, your, or whoever your favorite is, Anselm. But, but historically, uh, the Christian church and leaders in the Christian church have done different things at different times to meet different challenges. In other words, the history is much deeper and wider than people who are, are first getting into apologetics actually realize. And so there's all these resources. We talked about beauty and imagination and story. Well, these are these are resources that have been there waiting to kind of uh, to appropriate and use for us today. So we spent a couple chapters on that. And then we get into surveying kind of contemporary methodology. And we've we've worked really hard to be fair on that because we feel like um, sometimes apologetics has become tri very tribal. Um, so my student, you know, new students will come to, come up to me and right away, if they're into apologetics, they want to know what school are you? What, what, what approach do you use? And, um, and, and it becomes very tribal. I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, you know, you've got your favorite, favorite apologist. And we're really trying to, to we, we really learn something. We've learned something from all the schools, but we're trying to say what are some of the strengths of each one and what are the weaknesses of each one uh, in a way that I think is unique and, and we haven't seen done in quite this way. And so that really launches us up from that point in the book. It launches us into kind of what we've already talked about, apologetics at the cross, what this might look like, and then into some really practical stuff in the final four chapters. And, and kind of another unique part about the book is that we do cultural analysis. And so you're, we're really combining Bible, church history, theology, philosophy, um, and, and also cultural analysis, which, which oftentimes gets maybe done in you know, a book on cultural engagement. But, if, but because we recognize we're not engaging with blank slates, to kind of lay out in, in a general picture some of the unique features of late modernism that we're all swimming in and we don't even realize it. To say, hey, when someone's objecting to like biblical sexual ethics, there's something underneath that that they're probably not even aware of that they've just assumed. And if you just argue up here, you're probably not gonna get very far until you actually learn how to, again, get into their even framework that they don't even know they have and engage on that level. So, so that's actually pretty vital in the practical kind of how to do this today is learning what sociologists call plausibility structures. What are the things people just assume, they take for granted, and therefore they have certain conclusions, but they, have, but they haven't even thought about these assumptions. We've got to learn how to navigate those better. And so that's, that's another unique feature of the book. Awesome, that's super helpful. So everybody, um, make sure you go out and get Apologetics at the Cross. It's on sale for pre-order. What date does it come out of? Comes out, yeah, it comes out May 15th. Okay. So we're, yeah, if you order it now, you'll get it in a few days, uh, depending on yeah. if you have the right type of okay. shipping. On Amazon.com. How can people get in contact with you, Josh, on social media? And um, do you have a do you have your own blog? I don't blog. Um, I, I I don't think I'd be a very good blogger. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, I have lots of limitations, but we won't go into those. And blogging is probably one of them. So I don't I don't blog. Um, I mean, I'm uh, Josh Shatro on Twitter. I have a weird last name. It's uh, it's J O S H is my first name, and then C H A T R A W. So yeah, you can follow me on on Twitter. Um, that's probably the the best way. Um, and then my my email, uh, you can look me up on Liberty's website. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Josh. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you.